Thank you, Peter. What a great way to open worship. Welcome to the worship service of Westkirk Presbyterian Church, where we gather together to hear God speak to us, where we get a chance to respond to him in our singing and in our prayers, where we hear the word of God preached. We welcome you today. Whether you're here with us in person or streaming with us on the internet, we're glad that you're here. I do have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, as you came in, you should have gotten a West Kirk Weekly that has what, uh, some of the activities that are going on within our church. Uh, January 10, there's a Christian's Ministry Interactive Zoom uh, thing going on. You can read about that here. We also have our Children's Ministry Virtual Christmas Program that's available online. And then also the artwork that we've been talking about from our own members that's in the hospitality center. And then we're packing the pantry to help the, those that are uh, needing food. And then the new announcement is January 16, we'll be taking down the Advent decorations. So again, many hands make light work. I greet you today from Psalm 105, where it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. What a great message to us from the Psalms. One other announcement that I have is the, the office will be closed this week, so if you have business, make sure you call ahead of time to make sure someone's around. And now, hear the word of, the God, word of God that calls us to worship this morning. From wherever you are, please rise in heart or body to hear the word, God's word, calling us into worship this day from Psalm 36, 5 to 9. Let us read this responsively. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountain of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Sisters and brothers, the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit calls you to himself this day. Let us worship God. I would invite you to remain standing and sing together a couple of Christmas carols, angels we have heard on high and angels from the realms of glory.
As we gather in worship today, our celebrations of Christmas continue. We celebrate in this season the marvelously good news that our Lord Jesus came to earth as a human, just like us, but without sin. He came so that we who sin may be freed from sin, with the peace that comes in knowing that Christ Jesus came. Let us confess our sin and receive the assuring word, words of our pardon found in Christ alone. We'll be praying a corporate prayer of confession that's printed in your bulletin and will also appear on the screen. Let's pray this together. O oh God, in the beginning you spoke and creation was born, the object of your loving care. In the fullness of time you spoke and the Word became flesh, Jesus, gift of your love. We wonder at the miracle of creation. We stand in awe before the mystery of the incarnation. Forgive us, earthbound creatures, feeble in faith, empty of hope, lacking in love. This year, let the miracle and mystery of Christmas happen for us again. We wait upon you with ready hearts, O God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take me home, my Father, take me, take me, save me through thy Son, that which thou wouldst have me make me, let thy will in me be done. Long from thee my footsteps string, weary come, I now am praying. Fruitless years with grief recalling, humbly I confess my sin. At thy feet, O oh Father, falling, to thy household take me in freely now to thee i proffer freely life and soul i offer Beloved of God, I invite you to rise in heart or body again to hear these gospel words proclaimed to you this morning from Isaiah 62, verses 10 through 12. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. People of God, in Jesus Christ, you are a holy people, known by God, redeemed of the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
may be seated. We come now to the time in our worship that we call the Prayer of the Kirk, our weekly congregational prayer, a time in worship where we lift up uh, in prayer our family and our friends and our own lives before God's throne of grace. We have an ongoing and regularly updated concerns list that's found on the second page of the weekly, which was inserted in the bulletin if you're here with us in person. Otherwise, the weekly can be found on our church's website at westkirk.org. Uh, You'll see on the concerns list that we have uh, some new names in bold. I want to draw your attention to those here now, give some updates as well this morning. Uh, This morning in worship, I will pray for these things, so I invite you to join me in your hearts as we lift them up together before God. Uh, But if you have a pen or a pencil, now would be a good time to take that out, jot down some notes as I go over these things. Uh, That way you can be praying for these folks as the week goes on. Uh, You'll see on our list that we continue to pray for pastors and churches with whom we have a share in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning and this week, we're praying for Pastor Ben Falconer and Proclamation Presbyterian Church, which is the former church home of Nathan and Jessica Hyatt in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Uh, Also new on the list, though, we mentioned uh, this last week, condolences to Scott and Amy Withers and their family on the death of Amy's aunt, Michelle Myers. Michelle passed away uh, last Saturday evening. Uh, Please be in prayer for the family as well as Michelle's husband, Wayne. Uh, We mentioned these last week as well, but we continue to pray for Dr. Chris DeVlantes, Barb and Jack Wilson's son-in-law. He had a fall, hurt his back, knocked out some teeth. Uh, He had surgery on Wednesday, which the doctors were hopeful uh, that he would have uh, immediate relief after the surgery. I have not heard an update yet on, on how that went, though. Uh, We have also been praying for uh, Jacob Peplinski, Amy Withers' cousin. Uh, He and his family lost everything in an apartment fire. Uh, Some of you have been reaching out this week wondering how we might assist this family. Uh, And so we uh, printed in the weekly a a link to a GoFundMe page uh, that has been set up to support the family in this time. And we share that with you this morning and we continue to pray for the Peplinski family. If you have something in your life that you would like prayer for, we would love to be the congregation that prays with you and for you. Let us know how we can be praying. There's a number of ways you can do that. Uh, On the Connect card, that extended portion of your bulletin, there's a little box for prayer requests. You could jot one down there and turn it in uh, in the offering container. Otherwise, call us in the church office or email us and let us know how we can join you in prayer. So, Let's go to God who is merciful in prayer this morning. As I said, I will pray, though I invite you to join me in your hearts. When I am done praying, I will invite you to join your voice with mine as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we come as your church this morning to pray for your church this morning, marveling at your work in the world to draw hearts to yours in Christ Jesus. We thank you for these other churches that we pray for each week and ask your help and your guidance for them as we ask your help and guidance for our own church, that your will would be done and that you would be honored in our gatherings and in our goings out, in our ministries and in our love and care for the world around us. So we hold up before you Proclamation Presbyterian Church and Pastor Ben and ask, Lord, be glorified in them, we pray. We hold up before you those with health concerns today, Dr. Chris DeVlantes and and others who have been on our hearts and in our prayers. Bring healing and renew strength. Guide the doctors and nurses as they care for the sick and the hurting. Be at work, Lord, in all of these situations, drawing hearts to yours as we turn to you with our pain and with our illnesses, with our anxieties and with our fears. Comfort us. And uphold us, Lord, and help us to trust in you. And we do pray for Amy's cousin Jacob and his family. Lord, you know their lives. You know their needs. Provide for them, Father, and lift them up from the depths of their loss. Be merciful, we pray. And Lord, through such things as these, turn our hearts to you, that we might praise you for your mercy and for your provision and give you thanks. Into your hands we commit ourselves and all our needs together with the needs of the whole world. For it is in you, O God, that we hope. It is in you, O God, that we trust. And so with the words that our Savior has taught us to pray, we pray now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come to the point in the service where we generally would take an offering. Uh, we would invite you, if you're here in person, to place your offering in the container in the narthex. Or if you're streaming or other, otherwise want to give, we can give through our website of westkirk.org. The psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And especially this time of the year, we see the goodness of God in sending us a Savior. Our offerings are just an expression of our thanksgiving, whether it be monetary, whether it be giving of our time, whether it be sharing with one another, loving one another. I would encourage you to be generous, uh, not only now, but throughout the year. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how amazing you are, how gracious you are, how much love you have for your children. And Lord, we thank you today for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Lord, help us then to give back some of what you've given to us, that we may show our thankfulness to you to support the work done in your name. Lord, humble us. Help us to recognize that everything that we have comes from you. And help us to be faithful too, Lord, in giving of our offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the West Kirk Presbyterian Church Book of Worship, the minister of the church is instructed to be careful to remind the congregation of the meaning and the nature of baptism. And it's always good to be reminded of why we do this, especially when we baptize babies and children who cannot make a profession of faith on their own. And at our last baptism, I spoke about the covenant that God made with Abraham and giving him and his descendants the promise of blessing by grace through faith. And after establishing this covenant, God provided Abraham with a covenant sign. And then on the basis of his faith, as their representative, Abraham gave that sign to every other person in his family, in his household, males who were over the age of eight years old, over the age of eight years old, and even slaves. And receiving the sign did not, therefore, mean that the person who received it was saved. But it was a marker that involved the shedding of blood, and it signified that the person was different, and that they were set apart for God, a part of a distinct family of people. Now, under the new covenant in Christ, there remains a sign of the covenant. But this background helps us to understand why baptism is administered to children of one or both parents who also profess faith. But why did God change the sign? In Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6 and also in Jeremiah 9:25 and 26, God makes it clear that circumcision was a sign. That sign doesn't save anyone, but it points to what does save, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In other words, Moses and the prophets are reminding us that God is not interested in so much in the physical mark of circumcision, but in the spiritual thing that it represents, a right relationship with God. And this is what is meant when each passage refers to the circumcision or the uncircumcision of the heart. And why Paul in Colossians 2 says this, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead 
And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So Paul explains what baptism is for the Christian. Scripture doesn't record Jesus ever explaining this to his largely Jewish audience because they already understood those connections. But Paul's Gentile audience did not. So Paul takes the spiritual and the physical aspects of circumcision and connects them with the spiritual and physical aspects of baptism. He applies them both to the believer. It makes sense for Paul to include this here because he's been connecting the faith of the Christian with the faith of Abraham, thus God's covenant with Abraham and its sign. Now being a part of the new covenant in Christ is the same as being part of the Abrahamic covenant. Each are identified by true faith, faith in God through Jesus Christ alone. Physical circumcision is no longer necessary. We heard that when we were in Acts chapter 15 because Jesus fulfilled the blood requirements in symbolizing the atonement, the blood sacrifice on the cross. But spiritual circumcision, circumcision of the heart, is still required because it is synonymous with true faith. It's an inward reality of the outward mark that the outward mark only symbolized and remembered. Physical baptism replaces physical circumcision. Circumcision is not required for the Christian, but baptism is. The spiritual circumcision of the heart that physical circumcision represented and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that physical baptism represents are both now present in New Testament baptism. That is why we continue to baptize infants and children. We welcome them into the covenant family of faith with a sign, a picture, that serves to remind us not of their salvation, but of God's promise of salvation to those who believe who are a part of the covenant family of faith. With that, I would like to invite Peter and Hannah and my wife Sasha to come forward. Peter and Hannah, do you acknowledge your daughter's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? If you do answer, we do. Do you claim God's covenant promises and benefits for your daughter? And by faith, do you look to the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your daughter as you do your own? Do you now unreservedly dedicate your daughter to God and do you promise by relying on God's power and grace through the Holy Spirit to live an exemplary life before her? And do you commit yourself to pray with and for your daughter to teach her the scriptures and the great articles of our faith in Jesus Christ? Do you promise to use every means provided by God, including faithful participation in the life of the church, to bring your daughter up in a loving discipline of the Lord. And now to you, congregation, Christian family, acting for yourselves and on behalf of the whole body of Christ, do you assume responsibility with these parents for their daughter's spiritual welfare? If you do, please say, we do. And do you commit yourself to set a Christ-like example before her to provide all that is necessary to the end that she may one day confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Peter, as a representative of your family, what do you name your daughter? Ivy Rose Bailey. Ivy Rose Bailey.
Well, the name ivy means a climbing vine plant. And it was really a tough one for me. It's of English origin, and believe it or not, the name rose means rose, which in some cases is a climbing plant. And here's what I know about climbing rose plants. They require rich but well-draining soil and need regular feeding. Have you ever heard of Griffith Buck? Anyone here heard of Griffith Buck? No Iowa State Ag people in church this morning. Griffith Buck is a horticulturalist. He's gone now. Famous at Iowa State for having developed hybrid roses that would thrive in the Midwest. In other words, he created a climbing rose bush that would survive harsh Iowa winters. Hi, Ivy Rose. I'm not paying you any attention, am I? Now, the only reference to a rose flower we see in Scripture comes to us from the Song of Solomon. And we're not sure exactly what that is about. But what I picked for you today is another wonderful passage, this one from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 36, 25. And it speaks a little bit about what we're doing today in baptizing your daughter. It says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And this is a picture from the prophet Jeremiah of the salvation that God has won for us in Jesus Christ. You're hanging in there, sweetie pie. Yeah. So now with that, I would like to baptize Ivy Rose and then we'll pray together. Ivy Rose Bailey. <laughs> Child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, what a blessing it is to be here today. It's a blessing to be here because the weather has been so bad and it was a treacherous ride, but it's a blessing to be here because of the promises, to be reminded of the promises you've made us in Christ Jesus. And we're thankful for this sign, Lord, a sign that points us to you and points to the salvation that he accomplished on our behalf. And we pray, Lord God, that Ivy Rose would indeed grow to be a beautiful flower of the gospel for you that she would be a radiant reflection of this salvation that you've won for her in Christ. Bring her to saving faith, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. This is a certificate for you to commemorate the day. And uh, I would like to encourage all of you who are able to come and meet Ivy Rose, if not today, then sometime in the future. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Congregation, I would invite you to rise in heart or body to hear the word of the Lord uh, read to us by David Vorm. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 8 through 12. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. 
And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their disease left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Back when I was in college, <clears throat> author Frank Peretti published the first and most celebrated of his Christian novels. That's dating me a little bit, but some of you will, will identify with the time. And that book was called This Present Darkness, and the plot took place in a small town in America. And it told the story of spiritual intrigue that had taken place between the forces of good and evil, spiritual powers, in the fight for the soul of this town. And uh, the book sold over two and a half million copies, of course, mostly to a Christian audience, and it really brought this issue of spiritual war warfare and the presence of the spiritual in our lives, as well as uh, interacting in our earthly lives, to the consciousness of Christians, became part of our vernacular. Now, that was a pretty significant time in Sasha's and my spiritual development, and so we devoured that book and the sequel, like most of our friends did. And I didn't have the theological discernment then that I do now, and I don't want to ruin the fond feelings that I have of that book. Um, it was a formative time in my life, so I'm just going to leave that alone. But suffice it to say, the title of Peretti's book came from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Understanding that Paul's letters are his primary source of discipleship to those who he has led to faith or who are in the churches that he founded, and that that material is what he wrote to give to them after these lengthy stays with them or after his ministry there. What we know is that the book of Ephesians then, this letter back to the Christians in Ephesus, give us some of the context of what was happening here in chapter 18 and 19 of the book of Acts. Of course, Ephesus was nothing like the uh, little fictitious town of Ashton in the fiction novels of Frank Peretti, but Ephesus is where we are as we return to chapter 19 of Acts today. So let's pray. God of all, on this first Sunday after Christmas, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. His birth, his life, his death and resurrection. Thank you also for your written word. Through it, we learn. We learn of you. We learn more of this great plan to redeem those you have uh, loved through that beautiful work of your son, and we learn the lengths you go to love us. We learn who you made us to be and how you call us to live. So thank you that your word gives us hope for our future. And as it is read and preached today, send your spirit so that we can grow to know you more and to love you better and discover our role in your ongoing kingdom work in our world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Prior to our Advent break in the book of Acts, the end of chapter 18 and the beginning of chapter 19 took Paul from Corinth and briefly to Ephesus before returning to Jerusalem and Antioch, ending the second missionary journey, and then with very little fanfare, embarking on this third missionary journey, traveling north to his home country and then west again, that would be west, west again to uh, Ephesus. And Ephesus seemed to be, even then, the main point. 
The Holy Spirit was directing him, but Luke was concerned in his writing to emphasize the importance of Paul getting there, getting to Ephesus, staying there for a while. And as we pick things up here at chapter 19 at verse 8, we figure out why. When you think of Ephesus, what do you think of? I imagine that most of us think, well, um, it's a city in the Bible, and we may not know where it is or if it's still around, but it's in the Bible, we know that, and most of us probably know that there was a church there, and Paul wrote to that church in the letter that I referenced before, it carries its name, but what else do we know? Well, as I said, it's not like small-town America. But you may remember from the end of chapter 18 that this is where Luke introduces us to Apollos. After Paul's brief stop over there, Apollos had come. And he was a brilliant North African Bible scholar and preacher, but he wasn't up to speed with the gospel. He did not know Jesus other than what John the Baptist had been preaching about about his coming, Paul's companions in gospel ministry, that would be Priscilla and Aquila that we also met, they had remained in Ephesus and had met Apollos and they had discipled him there. And then before Paul returned to the city, they had sent him off back to Corinth to go, to, to go west where he had a significant ministry. You may also recall from my mention in the previous sermon from Acts, that Ephesus was the home of the Temple of Artemis. This was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So just picture in your mind what that might have looked like. And that'll give you an idea of a little bit more of Ephesus. It was also known as the Treasure House of Asia. And it was known as this not because it was one of the leading cities of the Roman Empire alone, but because it was a place of great ambition for people materialism, uh, decadence, sexuality. The Temple of Artemis, or Diana, was a massive work of architectural brilliance, but it was also the home to hundreds of temple prostitutes and a thriving religious and economic institution of fertility worship was there. So no wonder Paul can reflect on his time in Ephesus as a spiritual war against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Paul's spiritual battle was waged primarily through his Bible teaching, through the Word of God. And of course, this would be the Old Testament. But in those first verses that Dave has read for us already, we hear Paul begin his ministry in the synagogue, that is his pattern, and there must have been success because as he continues to teach and reason and dialogue with Jews, but also with the God-fearing Gentiles who worship there, he remained there for three months. And for Paul, man, that's a pretty good run before getting kicked out. But when the tide of opinion finally does turn against the gospel, Paul makes some kind of arrangement, Luke tells us, to rent out a lecture hall at a school of a local philosopher named Tyrannus and continue his teaching ministry there. Now, this would have been during the middle of the day because in that culture at that time, like still in some cultures today, people took the middle of the day, the heat of the day off. So there would have been teaching going on there from 9 till, well, in the morning, and then from 11 Till four or so, people would go home for siesta and get out of the sun. <clears throat> and this would have been the time that Paul would have rented the lecture hall to give his lectures. So Paul would work in the mornings and the evenings to support himself. And then from 11 to four or so would lecture and debate. Now that's all interesting, but did you hear Luke's commentary on the work of the ministry? He said, beginning in verse 10, that this continued for two years. And so all of the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now, there's some significance in that. 
from this location in Asia Minor, the ministry of the gospel, and touched every corner of the region. Why Luke seems so determined to tell how the Holy Spirit was involved in bringing Paul to and from this city. But not only that, the Holy Spirit used the gospel ministry of Paul to begin to break down the pagan forces of spiritual evil that centered in Ephesus, verses 11 and 12. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. And their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Now that sounds a little goofy to us. And we're not sure it even sounds all that right. Verse 12 is naturally the place where televangelists come up with their scheme to sell handkerchiefs for, to the faithful for a good price. Raise money to support their ministry. But as we're going to see shortly, false ministry is what seeks for profit. But here the Holy Spirit is meeting this very pagan, very religious people right where they are in ways that they would understand to do actual miracles that authenticated the teaching of Paul. And that's the difference. The teaching came first and then the authentication through the miracles. Paul has been working hard to support himself in labor and then teaching the Bible in his free time, so to speak. He was not a religious shyster trying to convince people through his preaching to support his ministry financially. It's a legitimate ministry, and all legitimate ministry, like Paul's, does not profit from God's word and power, but does expose darkness. And like we heard on Christmas Eve, it is the light of the gospel that Paul was preaching from the Hebrew scriptures in this Gentile city, and it had the power to expose sin and to eradicate sin. Are you trying to figure out how to eradicate some sins perhaps some secret sins in your own life. I would say give up on trying to beat it in your own power and pour yourself into God's words so that the light of the gospel continually is washing over your mind and your heart and that sin is flushed out. Legitimate ministry exposes darkness. So let us all be consumed with and engaged in legitimate gospel ministry. But as I suggested a moment ago, there's also false ministry. And one of the ways we know the difference is that false ministry, as I said, seeks for profit. And as we might expect then, being depraved human beings... The word of Paul's work was circulating. The impact of the gospel was making its way through the city and through the entire region. And so those who viewed what Paul did as simply being a very successful speaker or having a successful teaching ministry tried to get in on some of that for themselves. Listen to verses 13 to 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now exorcism would have been big business in a place like Ephesus. 
And the key, if you were an exorcist in Ephesus at that time, the key at being successful was knowing how to access the most powerful spirits and gods. And these seven sons of the Jewish high priest Sceva were trying to tap into this, tap into the market, and they thought, based on all that they were hearing and seeing from Paul, that they had found the key to success. They would just call out in the names of Jesus and of Paul himself. I have to imagine that this hilarious story eventually became like the most famous tale among the Christians in Ephesus. This is the famous place where the sons of Sceva fled naked and wounded, attempting to cast out demons. But as soon as those guys uttered the name of Jesus like one too many times, this demon-possessed man in attempting to heal him, turned on them and left them exposed, literally and figuratively. Do you remember Jesus' words in the Gospel of Mark? And if a house divided against itself, if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Here we have a picture of this in action. Exorcists plying an evil trade tried to cast out evil demons and became the poster boys, I guess, for exposure, the exposure of evil in Ephesus. Let's continue at verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So there were a couple other results of the exposure of these religious charlatans. One is the gospel went forth even more. And then among the new fledgling Christian community in Ephesus, there rose a fear. It was a fear that their sins, their past sins, their secret sins, would also become exposed. And so they set about to confess their sins and rid themselves of any paraphernalia they had that was associated with their sin. It was even a burning of books. Now we can smile at how cute this story is, but we could also take it serious. And we could recognize that this same thing ought to be happening in our own lives as we are continuously exposed to the gospel and the preaching of God's word. In our own private reading of it, which will bring out the gospel and expose our sin in our small group Bible studies, And then get rid of anything that is not edifying in our own lives. And I'm serious about that. There's not a person in this room, myself included, who probably isn't wasting precious time that could be spent doing productive things. Or spending time with God. reading his word, engaging in ministry, but instead we are spending our time in mind-numbing activities or worse. By the end of this week, you know, we'll be in the new year, and you all know what that means. We're going to be inundated with commercials and advertisements about weight loss and resolutions and turning new leaves so to speak. 
So, here we are in Acts 19, and I have to ask, do you have any books at home or magazines that have no place in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ? Any apps or websites or subscriptions that indulge your secret sins or your addictions that need to go? Why does it take the new year to bring this sort of thing to our consciousness when all that we need to do year-round is continually bathe ourselves with the Word of God and the Gospel, which I would venture to guess most of us here and most of us watching online have professed faith in through Jesus Christ? When we engage in God's word and interact with other Christians who also confess their own struggles and hold one another accountable and encourage one another, this is the remedy to removing sin in our lives. Your profession of faith is not a free ticket to heaven. Do not use it as an excuse to ignore Jesus and live the life that God intends for those who really are trusting in him by faith alone for their very lives. So what do you need to burn in your life? Let's get rid of it. Because when darkness is exposed in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the darkness cannot stand. Flee the darkness and run to the light of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that the numbers in Scripture that we come across don't always mean anything to us, and we don't take the time to figure them out. But the value of all of that stuff, all of that garbage that the Ephesian church brought and sacrificed to God for the sake of Christ would have been, in today's dollars, equivalent to somewhere between 5 and 10 million. That's a lot of addiction. That's a lot of stuff that people in the church did not need in their lives. Verse 20 gives us the result. It's kind of like a summary of Paul's two-year two plus years of labor and ministry in Ephesus. Remember back then there were no 40 hour weeks, there were no days off, no vacation. He was at it every day. And of his work, of Paul's work, Luke writes, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Is God calling you today to follow him? Is he calling you to follow him through faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone and turning away from your sin and repentance? Calling you to eternal life? Or for those who are already saved to a greater ministry of service to him? One way or another, today is the day, not that you can't do this any day, but today is the day to respond to the calling that God has placed on your life. Sooner or later, things will be back to some semblance of normal around here. And when that time comes, I pray that we are all ready to adjust our schedules once again, but this time to include and make as a priority a serious study of the Bible with Christian friends who are committed to encourage one another and a commitment to not only attending worship here or wherever it is you are from, but finding a place in ministry to serve. Let's pray.
Oh God, may we not be intimidated by the darkness that is around us, allured by all the promises that the world has to offer. May we not believe the enemy's lies about how invincible we are and all the stuff of the world that we need in order to make us successful and to keep us happy. But may we rather worship you, you all-powerful God, and do so in every facet of our lives, especially where no one but you sees. Help us to walk in your strength, not in our weakness, and make us bold with truth. Make us aggressive in our spiritual walk and generous with the light of the gospel as we proclaim it in our lives, with our words, with our actions. May darkness retreat around us as we proclaim and live the gospel of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. We respond to the hearing of the word by singing, A Good Christian Men Rejoice. And I would encourage you not to let the words get in the way here as men here means mankind, both men and women. We rise in harder body to sing together. As a reminder, please be careful as you exit the church. Uh, you all are aware that it has been raining and freezing uh, this morning. People of God now receive this benediction. Now may the God who never abandons you and never lets go of you go before you in your darkness, stand beside you in your fears, and make you faithful in your temptations until Jesus comes. Amen. Go in peace.